So, good evening to all attendees from Indonesia. It's uh, still afternoon here in Madrid. So, good afternoon for those who come from Spain, which uh, is only, I think, me and Professor Merino. Uh, in, in Spanish, uh, they must say buenos tardes. It means uh, good afternoon. Uh, let me first start this session to greet you all with Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat malam dan salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. Yeah. The mean uh, it's the meaning is uh, great to uh, know you all and greetings for all of you and blessing for all of us, kind like that, Professor Medino. And first of all, I would like to thank you to all parties that are involved and make this even possible to be held, especially to Professor Merino, my mentor right here now in uh, Madrid, the director of Arrhythmia and Robotic Unit in La Paz University Hospital who is also now the current president of European Heart Rhythm Society. It's uh, an honor to be with you in this event. And I've been here for four weeks and it's a well spent time and a precious moment for me to learn from you and all the team. Uh, the other part that we would like to thank is the Department of the Cardiology of Universitas Sumatra Utara, especially to my head of department, Dr. Angia, cardiologist, EP consultant with initiated this event who will next uh, moderate the lecture session. We are also very pleased to have Dr. Sunu Budi Raharjo, the president of INHRS with us, also with uh, all the professor, doctor, experts and uh, experts in EP field from Indonesia. Truly, this event wouldn't be success without your attendance. Here in this meeting, we invite uh, to inform all of us, we invite uh, electrophysiologists, cardiologists, cardiology residents, and other parts like the nurse and technician also to, jo to join this delightful event. And before we enter the lecture session, let me give a little orientation how this session will be. At first, uh, I would like to ask for two opening remarks, which one is from our senior EPs in Indonesia, and the second one is from our Ina Sherer's president. And after that, we will continue to the main session. Hope all the things are going well throughout this. Now, let me invite the first person who will give an opening remarks. I will give you a little details about him. He is the first electrophysiologist in Indonesia. I would never say he's the oldest because he always has the spirit of a young man, I remember. <laughs> At the moment, now he works in Binawalia Cardiac Center, still active, which I spent four months previously there before I go to Madrid. It's a well, lovely moment to catch up with those things and learn uh, not only the skills, but also from his character. And all cardiologists in Indonesia, I think, must recognize him. He is Dr. Muhammad Munawar, PhD, cardiologist, EPIS consultant, interventionist consultant. Please welcome Dr. Munawar. Okay, thank you very much uh, for kind uh, introduction, uh, Dr. Yani. And again, that uh, yeah, I'm quite long time for in in, in EP actually. You know, at that time in in, in early ninety, just uh, back from Australia. And until now, again, that uh, the number of EPs still is very few. It's not like, I think it's not more than 50. Uh, even though that our population is quite uh, huge in, in number, comparing, let's say, uh, Spain. Spain. Um, and today we have uh, really lovely to have uh, Professor Moreno from uh, Madrid, and he is uh, it's already introduced by Dr. Yanni that uh, uh, we are lucky because uh, he is a president of EHRA. And number two is that uh, he's involved in uh, writing, discussing uh, about uh, what's uh, the guideline in VT and certain cardiac death. Uh, published in 2022. There are a number of, uh, a lot of uh, new recommendation, number of section, new number of uh, section, 
And I think uh, uh, Dr. Morino will give uh, some more detail regarding uh, the, the latest uh, guideline in, in uh, Fiji and Southern Cardiac Death. Again, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Merino, for giving us uh, regarding uh, the topic. Thank you, uh, Professor Munawar. Okay, you're mute. Yeah, Yanni, you're, you're still muted. Uh, Yanni, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If we all uh, note that uh, Professor Merino is wearing our um, unique, uh, unique uh, shirt, it's batik, and it's very lovely to see him wearing the shirt. It's quite fit for him. And uh, for that, um, the second, uh, we continue to the session. The second figure I would like to ask to give an opening remark is our president of INA HRS is from the uh, National Cardiac Heart Center in Harapan Kita. The meaning is the our hope in English, Professor Merino. So please welcome Dr. Sunu Budiraharjo, PhD, cardiologist, EPIS consultant. Please. Thank you, Dr. Yani. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Again, uh, I would like to appreciate and thanks uh, a lot to Professor Merino who uh yeah spend the time with will spend the time with us for the next one hour and it is really a good opportunity for us uh, the in hra society to learn directly uh from you um, to learn how to develop the guideline and also the content of the guideline itself from the first hand and yeah we indonesian heart rhythm society uh currently still uh, in the beginning of developing this EP field. Uh, remember, it's less than 50, uh, Prof. Merino. Now, 40, 48, yeah, 48 this uh, month. And now, uh, all of these members may be attending this uh, session, so we are really happy to learn and to uh, listen to your uh, lecture. And again, also, Dr. Munawar always gave us uh, the new insight in our society. So bringing many uh, professors, many EP uh, leaders in the, in the world to our society so that we can have better insight of the EP development for the future. And also thanks to Dr. Angya and Dr. Rani who facilitated these uh, uh, sessions. So again, thank you, Dr. Uh, Prof. Merino. And I will uh, bring it back to Dr. Rani. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikum salam. Thank you, Dr. Sunu. So, Professor Merino, the in Indonesia, people call uh, I usually call Yani, but in Madrid, I prefer Ahmad. to be called Ahmad. <laughs> the first name. So, uh, let me not making you uh, confused. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Suno, for the great delivery from your speech. And now I'm going to hand over the session to our moderator. He's currently work in uh, Universitas Sumatra Utara. I have explained the university with Dr. Professor Merino this morning. It's, it is the province located in the western part of Indonesia from where I, be, uh, from where I am. And it's... Uh, it has 15 millions of population. I think it's around one third of Spain, uh, but we only right now only have one electrophysiologist. He also a PhD yeah. candidate. And yeah. We hope yeah. the, your research will yeah. be going well. So let me invite you and hand over the session to you. Please welcome Dr. Angia Hairudin Lubis. Time is yours. And of note, at the end of the session, you may directly close the meeting. Please, Dr. Angia. Thank you, Dr. Ahmad Handayani. So I think we've known each other a bit better now. So I think Prof. Merino, uh, Dr. Munawar, and also Dr. Sunu, uh, I would like to introduce to Dr. Prof. Merino about our audience for today. Mostly our cardiologists and some others were uh, electrophysiologists and some others were uh, 
cardiology in training. We have 13 centers in Indonesia for uh, cardiology trainings, but uh, up until now we have around 1500 of cardiologists, but only 50 uh, are uh, electrophysiologists. So it's a huge, uh, huge gap between the numbers of the electrophysiologists, cardiologists, and the burden of the population. So, however, we're very happy to have you here. It's such a big pleasure to have a big guy like you with us. And I hope you will enjoy this meeting as the audience will. Dr. Merino, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Anja. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sunu and Professor Mohamed. Uh, and of course, Handajani. For me, it's a real honor and, and pleasure and uh, a privilege uh, to be today here with you. Let me share my screen. And uh, and also it's very interesting for me this topic because as you mentioned, uh, can you see my screen? Can you see the screen? Yes, nicely, Prof. Okay, perfect. So uh, uh, last year this uh, document was was published. That is the ESC guidelines uh, for BT and, and sudden cardiac death. Uh, I was involved in the in the production of the doco document. That was a privilege, but also a pain because I, we were discussing this, and it took many many hours, and it, it was really hard. Huh? But it, it, it's interesting to be involved in this process because you you always learn and have interesting discussions with your colleagues. So the document, uh, the previous one was a quite old one. And in, in, with this one, there are many new indications and or change indications. So it's impossible to cover all of them in, in just uh, half an hour. Uh, so we are going to focus our, our attention mostly in uh, the 10 commanders. This was a, a paper published afterwards, uh, selecting the most important parts and if we have time at the end of my presentation, we will review three uh, sections that I am particularly fond of them because I, I was responsible of them. Okay, so let's start with uh, one of the first commanders. And probably all of you have witnessed events similar to this. A young at least dying suddenly. While playing soccer, in this case, and this is when often you want, seen by the population you. as something catastrophic, when it you creates a lot of uh, social alarm. Of course, many strange things are done. Patients are being clapped on their faces, and but after the event, people forget. They think that this is uh, something that occurs mostly in young at least that are unlikely, but they uh, they don't think that this affects them. In the year 2017, I was trying to implement uh, a, a sudden cardiac death program in a region in Madrid, and I spoke to our politicians. At that year, we had in Spain over 6 million people living, and uh, out of them, 40, uh, 44,000 died, 53 from car accidents, 38 from murders, 8 for gender violence, that is important, but more than 8,000 from sudden cardiac death. So we are placing a lot of attention to all these three uh, modes of death, but very little to sudden death. I agree that these uh, other causes are important, but probably we are not giving the importance that is deserved to sudden death. I at that time, I, I tried to have this uh, a kind of application implemented in our region. That is an application that can be downloaded by volunteers. So in order that when a sudden cardiac death uh, uh, occur, uh, a call, to the emergency department was received, and at the same time that an ambulance was sent to the site, uh, uh, an alert was uh, received by nearby volunteers. 
So in, 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 in let's say, as an average, these volunteers arrive to the site five minutes earlier than, than, than the ambulance. And this is crucial to rescue these people. Eventually, you know, politicians are difficult people and this uh, was not implemented, but uh, it's something important. So all these things now are clearly uh, 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 collected in the guidelines. And so public access to defibrillation is considered a class one indication, so it's, it's clearly recommended. Prone CPR by bystander is also clearly recommended. And also, very important, is recommended to promote community training programs at the schools, at uh, uh, military service, and so on. Because we have to acknowledge that around between 15 to 20 percent of all of us will die suddenly, meaning that many of us will confront along our life people dying suddenly. So you need to be familiar, of course, we are doctors, we are cardiologists, so we know, we know how to perform uh, peace, uh, um, CPR. But this is not the case for the general population. And so this is why it would be important to train our children in these uh, this, uh, maneuvers. Also, uh, for the first time, it's recognized that mobile phone-based alerting is uh, also that uh, is recommended. Of course, we don't have the evidence to support this as a class one indication, but the future probably will come uh, uh, with these systems. Another thing that now is recommended in the guidelines is to uh, the importance of a comprehensive autopsy in victims of unexpected sudden death below 50 years of age. Uh, this was in particular uh, pushed by our British colleagues because they have a very well developed autopsy system. And uh, okay, this was, uh, this was uh, placed in the guidelines and it, it's important. It's not very important for, for uh, the victim, if, uh, uh, not for the victim, for the family, because the family needs to be uh, studied, especially now that we have more uh, uh, inherited causes of, uh, uh, of uh, sudden death recognized. In conjunction with this, is also recommended what is called a genetic autopsy. So victims of sudden death should have collected a blood uh, sample in order to uh, study, uh, 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 in order to have their families benefiting. And also ideally, this sample should be also stored for future developments in the field. Also, uh, it's interesting to see that now uh, the guidelines provide several uh, figures and flowcharts that are really visual and in, important. And this is one of the examples. This uh, gives you an idea that these diseases associated with sudden death and ventricular arrhythmias behave in a different way. Some of them mostly present at, at, at young age, like a, a catecholaminergic polymorphic BT that usually occurs at, at youth, but others like chronic uh, coronary artery disease is mostly a, a disease seen in, in all people. There are also differences in the way of presentation. Some of them are linked to a sport. Some of them have uh, genetic basis. And also some of them presents mostly as uh, polymorphic BT, like long QT, and others are mostly presenting as monomorphic BT, like a uh, a remogenic right ventricular uh, cardiomyopathy. Uh, genetic evaluation is uh, clearly uh, uh, mentioned in the guidelines because it's, it's uh, uh, playing a more preponderant role every year. Uh, there are certain diseases in which this is clear, long QT, Brugada syndrome, and CPVT, sorry. Others, the, the situation of genetic testing is less clear, like in, for idiopathic BF or early repetition syndrome. Uh, and this is uh, uh, clearly uh, uh, recommended the guidelines. So genetic testing now is considered a class one indication. There are other re recommendations related to genetic testing, but I'm going to skip them for the interest of time. 
Uh, there are flowcharts clearly recommending the, 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 the pathway that you should follow, both in terms of diagnosis, so the, te the techniques and the tests that you should uh, uh, use in these patients, to at least ECG, of course, echocardiogram, 24 uh, hours holter, and also how to manage these, these patients. In particular, there is something new about how to manage uh, patients with uh, presenting with BT in the emergency department. As you know, there was uh, a lot of debate in the past. In many countries, amiodarone is the, let's say, the most common use uh, drug. However, uh, after some trials like the Procamio trial, now it's recognized that procainamide is, uh, is better than amiodarone, but even better than procainamide is cardioversion. So cardioversion should be the um, treatment of choice for acute termination of BT, unless there is something that is not recommended to use it, like for example, anesthetic risk or, or whatever. So this is also uh, considered now a class one indication. So DC cardioversion should be the treatment of uh -huh. choice for BT termination, because it's the most efficacious way of terminating BT and it's the safest uh, uh, treatment. Uh, now going into uh, chronic management of these patients, let's uh, start with ischemic cardiomyopathy. So there are some indications that remain unchanged. So ICD therapy is recommended as a primary prevention in patients with ischemic left ventricular dysfunction and uh, signs of heart failure. For patients in, in, uh, in class one uh, high heart failure, the, now, uh, this is, uh, mm, yeah, let's say, similar to the heart failure gui guidelines. So now this has been downgraded to a uh, class 2A indication. Why? Because with the new drugs, we know that sun death has uh, decreased in, in incidence. And now there is some ex skepticism about the true benefit of, uh, of, uh, of uh, ICDs in this population. In fact, in ERA, we are conducting a, a trial that is called PROFIT ERA that will randomize roughly 4,000 patients, ischemic patients with left ventricular dysfunction to an ICD or just conventional medical therapy. So the time will tell us whether an ICD should be uh, still implanted in this, let's say, MADI2 population, okay? Uh, in terms of uh, uh, other uh, indication in ischemic cardiomyopathy uh, patients, we, uh, there are patients presented with uh, uh, the symptomatic uh, BT or ICD shocks despite amiodarone. So in the past, it was unclear how to proceed. It was recommended even to uh, escalate anti drugs. But now the recommendation is that after amiodarone in this population, uh, ablation should be performed. Uh, to be honest, I think that this indication arrives uh, a little bit late because just at the time that these guidelines were published, uh, this paper from the uh, uh, Spanish group, we were part of the study as well, uh, compare uh, ablation or anterimic drugs in patients presenting with BT, okay? So without the, the need of a failure of amiodarone. And you see that ablation was superior to drugs in terms of this combined point, cardiovascular mortality, ICD shocks, heart failures, hospitalization, or uh, complications. And there was another trial, the Partita trial, that was in the same direction. So. I think that the, the threshold to uh, use ablation in this population is getting lower and lower every year. Uh, and this uh, is also uh, uh, reflected in, the, sorry, uh, in this other recommendation. Now we are talking about a, in a different subset of patients. So patients that presenting with uh, monomorphic BT but preserve 
ejection fraction, so more than 40%. This is the typical situation in, 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 in which we don't have a clear indication for an ICD because they don't have severe left ventricular ejection fraction. So in the past, despite that, well-tolerated BT, non-severe uh, left ventricular dysfunction, still we were indicating ICDs. Now, for the first time, it's left to the, uh, to the physician whether to go for ablation or an ICD implantation. It's up to you because there is not a clear evidence to support one against the other. Now uh, we move to uh, DCM, so non-ischemic cardiomyopathies. And now what is new is that the, the importance of two things, one is genetic testing, and the second thing is CMR, magnetic resonance, is uh, acknowledged in these guidelines. In the past, it was just DCM, but now we know that certain genes associated with DCM are particularly risky. So it's recommended that all these patients need uh, 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 genetic testing, especially if they have uh, uh, signs suggesting a uh, inherited disease, like uh, uh, presence of AV conduction delays uh, below 50 years of uh, age, family history. Or sudden kind of death. Uh, the other thing is that CMR should be performed in uh, in all these patients. It's not a class one indication, but it's recommended. And uh, also, uh, uh, that, okay, there are other indications. I'm going to skip this one. In terms of uh, going to secondary uh, uh, prevention or primary prevention. ICD should be uh, considered in patients with DCM, with heart failure uh, and left ventricular dysfunction, severe, but not as a class one indication like in ischemic patient. Here is a class 2A. This was after the Danish trial, as you remember. This was a, a trial exploring this indication and so no uh, benefit comparing to optim optimal medical therapy. So patients with severe left ventricular dysfunction a heart failure and this end, an ICD can be recommended, but it's not as straightforward as in ischemic cardiomyopathy. Then there are new things like uh, now, if uh, okay, you have a patient with a DCM, but he has other conditions like some genes associated with sun death, la as lamina, la uh, lamin genes, or, or uh, and and the presence of non-sustained VDs or AV conduction delays, then you should consider an, an, an ICD. And the same if you have, for example, other factors like like uh, like enhancement in CMR or uh, the presence of uh, these diseases at your age. Okay, these are more more or less the ten commanders of the guidelines. Now I would like to share with you. Uh, my favorite parts because they, 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 they were those that I needed to, I was responsible of them. So I am particular fond of them. Let's start with idiopathic PVCs, BTs. What is new in the guidelines? Okay, probably you are all aware of this kind of patients, patients with frequent PVCs or even bars of non sustained BT. What is new? We have new recommendations for. Uh, ablation and antiremic drugs according to the uh, PVCBT mechanism. We have new, recommend, new recommendation regarding the type of antiremic drug to be used, new recommendation about the burden, and some new regarding uh, cardiomyopathy or uh, PVC CRT interaction. So let's uh, start with uh, this ECG. So if we, you pay attention to this ECG, and because many of you are EP, not all of you, but many, my question is from where this PVC is coming from? You may complain because, okay, this is not a good ECG, it's very small, okay? Your the size are ordered to me. If you have a large, uh, uh, a better seen ECG, 
So we have to acknowledge that this has a left van der branch block pattern. So it's coming from the right ventricle and it has an inferior axis, inferior axis. And also it's positive in D1 that is also suggesting of a right ventricular off track origin. In fact, uh, uh, this was the case. This is a Columbus 3D mapping system map. And you see that the red uh, dot represent the earliest activation site that was located at the right ventricular for track. We know that these patients can be easily and safely treated with ablation. In fact, this was the case with a single burn there. You see that the patient, the, the PVC was gone and never went back. So this uh, population is uh, particularly uh, particularly uh, favorable for ablation, successfully and safely. There, there is another condition of idiopathic uh, PVCs, but mostly BT, that is fascicular BT. That is uh, a BT mechanism related to sun macro reentry uh, involving the fascicles of the left bundle branch and uh, producing this kind of tachycardia. So tachycardia now with right bundle branch appearing, so coming from the left ventricle and typically with superior axis, okay? So coming from the inferior part of the left ventricle and with a very narrow, somewhat narrow chorus complex. So these tachycardias are often confused with the SBTs, but they are, they are not, they are uh, BTs. We know that these tachycardias can be effectively and safely treated by ablation uh, in these places. That is in the septum, close to someone in between the ep apex and the mid, mid uh, portion of the, of the left ventricle. So these two situations are completely different to other uh, sites of origin or mechanism of idiopathic BT. For example, here you see uh, a map, Columbus map, you see the right ventricular for track, and here is the, aor the aorta and the left ventricle. And you see in a minute rotating the, that the earliest activations shown by this ro red dot was placed at the right, uh, at the uh, aortic uh, root. One of, uh, it was on the right uh, aortic cusp. So this is a different situation because we often need to do strange things, uh, uh, have the catheter uh, close to the coronary arteries. Sometimes even we needed to apply uh, RF between two catheters, bipolar ablation. So in, in general, the efficacy is lower and also safety is probably is not high, but it's less clear. The third condition is that some of these uh, patients uh, may present idiopathic VT as the first, or idiopathic PVCs as the first manifestation of a, uh, a mask cardiomyopathy. But I am sure that many of you have uh, confronted it in the past, patients coming with idiopathic VC, PVCs, and then you bring them to the lab and then you have one PVC from one side, from another side, and they end to be an initial manifestation of a structural heart disease. So for this reason, and for the first time, catheter ablation, because there are randomized trials comparing drugs versus ablation in R uh, RVOT tachycardias, and demonstrated that ablation is superior. So for the first time, RVOT or left fascicular PVCs or BTs, uh, are considered a class one indication for ablation. So ablation first in this population. However, if the PVC or BT is coming from a different site, then probably we should start with drugs. And then if they fail, uh, ablation. Or maybe you should offer the patient this. Okay, at the end is the patient the one that needs to choose, but uh, this is the, the current recommendation. In terms of, uh, and maybe we can discuss later, uh, because in, in previous guidelines, 
the, there is a little bit uh, of uh, confusion. Some guidelines recommend to start with flecainide, others recommend to start with uh, beta blockers. Here we have a clear recommendation. RBOT or left fascicular ablation first, and then you can use beta blockers, calcium antagonists of type 1C drugs. But for non, for other origins, you should start with beta blockers or calcium antagonists. We can discuss later why. Then another important thing is the patient, asymptomatic patient with a high burden of PVCs. I am sure that many of you have seen such a patient, such a patient. So it's completely asymptomatic, many PVCs. What means many PVCs? More than 20%. Why? Because there are many papers and the, the threshold is more or less there, 20%. So this is a tricky situation, and we had a lot of discussion within the guideline committee, and finally ending with this agreement, because we have to acknowledge that this burden may change from time to time. So once you see the patient, 20%, six months later, is just 5%. So this is not uh, so clear. And so at present time, you may still consider ablation, but it's not a strong recommendation because uh, uh, I am talking in a patient asymptomatic and without any impairment of ventricular function, okay? Why not drugs? Because we know that drugs are not as efficacious as ablation, number one, and number two, are not devoid of uh, adverse events. So it's just ablation. And finally, our favorite drug, that is amiodarone, in brackets, because amiodarone is uh, widely used, shouldn't be used because it's uh, uh, associated with toxic e effects. So it should be the last resort after ablation and other drugs. For your convenience, there is this uh, table in which different scenarios are presented, right ventricular for drug, other, uh, uh, other uh, sources uh, with uh, left ventricular dysfunction, burden and so on and then with different recommendations for the different therapies, ablation, beta blocker, flecainer, or other. This is the flow chart. So idiopathic BT, first question is symptoms. Symptoms, yes, means that we need to treat this patient. Second question is coming from the RBOT or is a fascicular. If it's yes, it's cathode ablation first choice. If it's not, beta blockers or calcium uh, channel blockers. Okay, it's asymptomatic, no symptoms. Second question is more than 20% burden. Regular follow-up is the recommendation, but still you may consider ablation. 10% burden, okay, follow-up. Less than that, probably you need to discharge the patient and forget about him, okay? And, uh, and my final comment about uh, PVCs is about uh, other indications. So if the uh, burden is associated with uh, cardiomyopathy, ablation should be performed because there are high chances that this cardiomyopathy should be reversed. And, uh, and so therefore it's a class one indication. What is new is about, we have some patients with CRTs and in, in some of these patients, CRT is not working well due to frequent PVCs. And then you uh, should try to ablate them or use drugs, a class 2A indication. So this is also new. Okay, I'm going to skip this one. This was uh, about idiopathic PVCs. What is new about valvular heart disease? And to do so, I would like to present you a case. This was a 83-year-old male, hypertensive valvular ischemic heart disease. In fact, in 2011, he had angina, treated with PCI. And seven years later, he developed severe aortic stenosis and had a tabby implanted. He was initially treated with these drugs, even with the doxaban, because he had uh, atrial fibrillation as well. Very nice, everyone happy, fantastic. This was the tabby. You can see here a place with a pacemaker because uh, he had a uh, uh, left bundle branch broke. And this was his basal ECG, atrial fibrillation with the, this left bundle branch broke. Perfect. Everyone very happy. However, a few months after, the patient developed incessant 
Why chorus complex tachycardia? Le echo so preserve left ventricular ejection fraction with hypertrophy. Tabi was okay. And this was the tachycardia. I give you some minutes to look at it. Could be fascicular, could be scar related, could be SBT maybe, could be flutter. But this is uh, about BTs, so flutter will be strange. I know that you are Indonesian, so you are difficult people, so I, I am trying to cheat you. So, okay. So, difficult to know. So, we, sorry, I, we took the patient to the lab and we induced a second tachycardia. That was difficult for us because we were looking for the clinical one, but the second one was induced. Uh, we didn't like at all this uh, situation. Uh, Dr. Handayani was uh, at that time around there, and this was we had bad luck to tachycardias. And my question for you is what to do in this patient? Should we do substrate mapping and ablation? Maybe try to map the tachycardia with activation, entrainment, both, or something else? Please vote, vote in your mind because we don't have voting system, but you can vote in your mind. Uh, well, honestly, what would you do? Okay, we do something else. And what is, or we did something else. And why something else? The first thing is looking at the C. And there are two things that you need to be careful. The first thing is looking at the second level of these two tachycardias. You see that they are. They were the same, 340. That should make you suspicious that maybe, maybe they are setting the same circuit. The second interesting thing is, is that if you pay attention into the morphology of uh, the Kuras complex of B2, BT2, is quite similar to the uh, Kuras complex during atrial fibrillation. So what? So in atrial fibrillation, we know that ventricular activation is taking place through the Hispurkinji system. So if this is similar, maybe activation is taken in the same way. So, so now, second thing that you need to do, okay, first, look at the ECG. Second is look at your EP. So what we did is paste from the, uh, from the right ventricular apex, and what you see is that the post-pacing interval is, qu is quite similar to the tachycardia second length. What does it mean that? Uh, there are several questions, but in the interest of time, I'm going to skip it. That means that you should suspect that the mechanism of this tachycardia is van der Brand re-entry. Uh, in the second tachycardia, we did the same. We entrained the, the, this left van der Brand block tachycardia, and we had similar results. PPI from the right ventricular apex matching the, flat, uh, the tachycardia second length. And in fact, then with the suspicion of a BBRT of van der Brand reentant tachycardia, we tried to localize the his band electron that was here. No, not easy to see it unless you pay attention, okay? Because it was just after the current complex, okay? And then ablation was really Easy. You just need to go to the right bundle branch, ablate there, find this kind of electron, uh, this bundle branch, right bundle branch, and ablation is quite easy. And then after ablation, this is the resulting ECG. So uh, the importance of this is that uh, bundle branch reentry is this kind of tachycardia, it's using the main components of the Hispurkinji system. One bundle branch used integrally, other one retrogradely. And the importance is that for a scar related BT, the problem is to find the circuit, to find where the uh, ismus of a slow conduction is located. However, for bundle brand reentry, you just need to go to the right bundle and ablate there. So it's the easiest ablation that you can do. It's just looking for this kind of electrons, ablate, and that's it. So there are typical uh, clinical scenarios 
in which this mechanism is particularly frequent. So for aortic valve disease, especially after a aortic valve intervention, surgery of TAVI, and if the patient has no uh, this left ventricular dysfunction, you should suspect, strongly suspect this mechanism. And why? Because you can easily treat them with ablation. So recommendation number one. Recommendation number two is that if uh, this is not the case and the patient has left ventricular dysfunction, you should manage the patient similarly to other forms of this year. Finally, I'm going to go very fast because this is the last part, is neuromuscular disorders. What is new? So neuromuscular disorder, in fact, is a bad term because uh, these disorders are mostly not neuro intense because they don't have any neurological involvement. They have muscular involvement, both cardiac muscle involvement and skeletal muscle involvement. So that means that neurologists are not really very interested in this kind of patients. And as, as cardiologists, we see the word neuro and they say, okay, neuro, this is the same thing. So nobody is taking care of these patients. The problem is that some of these, sorry, of these patients are really uh, frequent. This is in particular myotonic dystrophy. Myotonic dystrophy prevalence is one out of 8,000. So much more frequent than long QT, much more frequent than Brugada syndrome and other inherited diseases. So uh, you have to be aware that this disease is associated mostly with con uh, hispokinia conduction defects, that these patients live uh, uh, until the age of 60 by average, and that one third of them will die suddenly despite not uh, severe left ventricular dysfunction. So in this uh, setting, Van der Brand re tachycardia is also very frequent. So this is the reason why in myotonic dystrophy patients presenting with palpitation, syncope, BT, or surviving cardiac arrest, uh, an EP study is a class one indication. And of course, if uh, you induce a BBRT, you should ablate it. If you don't induce uh, BBRT, then you should implant an ICD, of course, okay? There are other indications, but I, I don't want to bother you much. Just to, I, I, I'm going to go to the flow chart. So if the patient has any uh, problem about aortic cardiac arrest, BT, EP evaluation, and then if you induce BBRT, it's cathode ablation. If not, you should follow, most of the time you will implant an ICD. If the patient, uh, let's say, is asymptomatic and, if the, and has a spontaneous AV block, of course, you should implant a, a pacemaker. But if he has not a spontaneous AV block, but prolonged, prolonged PR or prolonged QRS complex, or these other two conditions, you should consider EP evaluation and eventually uh, a pacemaker implantation. Also, if uh, this is not fulfilled, but you follow the patient and the patient develop a sudden increase <coughs> of the PR or QRS intervals. <coughs> so to finalize my talk, some home messages. Number one, <coughs> the, we have to acknowledge the pub public problem of sudden death is a real problem. <coughs> the importance of genetics, that is playing a more important role year after year. Acute management of BT is changed. Now, uh, more importance given to cardioversion. Ablation and terrimi drugs is different now for idiopathic PVCs and BTs. So ablation is mostly recommended for RBOT, or fascicular tachycardias. Uh, now also the balance between ICD and ablation is changing for structural heart disease BT, so more ablation. And the differences between sudden cardiac death progression in different diseases. Again, the importance of genetics and cardio and, and similar. And nothing else. Thank you for attention. Thank you, Prof. Merino, such a 
beautiful slide, uh, elegant presentation, and I do believe that you know a lot of lot of key learning things that we can learn for our clinical practice. I do learn a lot from your presentation, Prof. Thank you very much. And while we are waiting for the question from the audience, I would like to start with. Uh, you mentioned about the use of beta blockers and CC at first line pharmacological approach in uh, non RVOT and non uh, uh, non fascicular VTs. Can can you explain more yeah. about the the drug option for that condition? Yes, Pro Professor Anja, I have to admit that you spoil my presentation. Ah, it's not here. No, because I had, uh, sorry, I had some backup question for the audience. And this was the number number one. <laughs> that is why we chose uh, beta blockers of calcium and antagonists. So your, your question is very uh, well taken. Uh, and why? Uh, the fact is that uh, in the previous guideline, there was uh, even uh, Fleck and I recommended as the, the number one. But uh, I think that for RBOT and fascicular RBTs, the situation is clear. These patients are clearly patients without structural heart disease. So uh, you may start with any of these drugs. Okay, you may consider, for example, there are studies that show show that if the tachycardia or PVCs have some relation with adrenergic tone, so for example, you perform an SSI test and they mostly appear with exercise and uh, then beta blockers make sense however if they disappear during exercise appear during uh, uh, rest then probably uh, flake and egg will work better yeah. okay but this is for uh, rbot pvcs for fascicular pvcs probably uh, verapamil should be the drug of, ch of choice but what about other origins then uh, the problem is, as I mentioned before, some of these patients may uh, present like uh, idiopathic PVCs, but eventually they will uh, present with starter heart disease. Yeah, We have uh, seen many of these patients that look like idiopathic and eventually then uh, they develop dysfunction or even RV um, dysplasia, right ventricular dysplasia. So in order to be in the safe side, it should be better to avoid flecainide in these patients because some of them will uh, eventually develop a start of heart disease, especially if they have more than one uh, morphologies of PBCs. Yes. This is the, the rational behind it. Thank you very much. As, as you also mentioned about, you know, amiodaron is very popular in Indonesia as, you know, first line agent for most of the arrhythmias right but it's now it's worldwide, uh, <laughs> worldwide. <laughs> yeah thank you very much for, for your clarification and we have a uh, dr yamin here dr yamin here is uh, also an electrophysiologist who is coming from one of the biggest hospital in indonesia please uh, dr yamin do you, do you have something to share with us thank you dr Anke. <laughs> good evening from marina i i appreciate your uh, comprehensive insights and summary on this uh, guideline. I would like to, I'm very interested in your very first slide, actually, uh, touching on the community uh, empowerment and also the accessibility to uh, AED or automatic external defibrillator. My question is, in Euro European countries, who is the most responsible to take this initiative for the public education and, and community education and also for the availability of the external defibrillator. And my second yeah. question that uh, I am not uh, hearing, I didn't hear any any uh, updates on the indication for uh, primary prevention for sudden death primary prevention in a pediatric patient. Because recently we have a patient which is uh, uh, strongly indicated for CRTD, but he is only seven years old. So we are we are a bit uh, confused of uh, deciding which uh, modality of uh, the best modality for this kind of subset of patient. Thank you, from Merino. Yeah, thank you very much for your question, uh, Dr. Jamin. Uh, I am honored for them, and they are very appropriate. 
So in terms of uh, uh, your first question, uh, who is in charge of these programs and so on, I conducted a short survey and it's very variable. It depends uh, from country to country in, in, in Europe. Uh, in some, they have active pro programs uh, uh, conducted by the government and other schools, for example, or have uh, this, such of these educational programs uh, linked to the military service, for example, in, in, in Switzerland, because they have regular uh, military service uh, uh, updates. And uh, so this is linked to that. But in general, even though uh, most of them lack of a structure, uh, community and a school uh, training programs, because I think that it's not just giving a, a course uh, once in your life. I think that you should have a, one of them and then probably every year use, I don't know, one hour or half an hour uh, to uh, train again or to remind uh, the kids how to do these things, because this will represent a, a, a huge advantage uh, for the population, because uh, in that way, we know uh, some death victims come to your hospital and it's highly dependent if someone started uh, uh, CPR. If they, someone started CPR, even badly done, many of them have chances of recovery. But those that were left without doing anything, uh, they are maybe recovered from the from the arrhythmia, but then the, their brain is dead. So it's highly important. I, I think that we need to convince our politicians that having close to 20% dying, dying every year suddenly means something. In terms of uh, uh, public defibrillators, this is uh, also is highly valuable. In Spain, for example, what we have, uh, uh, there is not a government program, uh, and it's mostly driven by companies. There are uh, Real Madrid Stadium. They have uh, uh, their external ICDs, no, uh, no ICDs, uh, defibrillators, and so on. What we are doing from in the Spanish Society of Cardiology, we have developed a kind of uh, application collecting the information where these uh, devices are, are placed in order to facilitate the, the access. But, uh, and also some years ago, I implemented in my own hospital, because it's funny, because sometimes you have more chances to be rescued if you die uh, on the street than if you die in the hospital. Because uh, if you are unlikely enough to die or have a BF in, a, I don't know, in orthopedic ward, maybe by the time someone arrives with an, an, a defibrillator, you are, you are done. So some years ago, we implemented in, in each ward an uh, external defibrillator in every ward, in, uh, in obstetrics, in pediatric, and internal medicine, in orthopedics. And surprisingly, you know it, which ward was where it was mostly used, we had more uses. You can guess. Aesthetic clinic. In there? General what? No, it was, for example, or, or, uh, obstetric or gynecology, nothing. Pediatric, nothing. Uh, general internal medicine, okay. But orthopedics, amazing, because it was full of all people with hip replacement and so on. So sometimes if you decide how to implement these uh, devices, uh, you, you may think about the population that you are, you are, you are planning to tackle. So this was the, your first question. The second is uh, pediatric. Pediat of course, there are pediatric recommendations in the guidelines. I didn't have the time to cover all of them. Uh, we have to admit that pediatric population is uh, particularly difficult because we don't have large trials. And also they are, uh, they are very heterogeneous because there are many different diseases. So this highly depends of the, of the situation of the patient. It's true that in pediatric patients, you try to be more, more conservative. And uh, it's particularly difficult to, to, to decide, to decide. Thank you, Prof. I think that's that's thank very, you for Marino. Yeah, thank you. Such, such a very clear answer. I think you mentioned earlier because in some situations we 
thought that the patient has an idiopathic PVCs. However, in longer follow-up, we found that it's uh, structural uh, PVCs, right? So we, have, we have a question following your statement from uh, Dr. Erika. Uh, she asked about when should we consider cardiac MRI for patients with uh, RVOT PVCs, considering that this, you know, RVOT PVC could be an early sign for uh, ARVC. Yeah, it's also uh, a, a very good question, and thank you for, for asking it. Um, in general, you may be tempted to say to all, no? because it's, it's the safe side, but we want to be efficient. So I think that if the PVC has a very clear uh, pattern of uh, RVOT, so a, a patient that uh, is, has no other symptom, has no worrisome symptom, so it's just palpitation, no syncope, no something stained, is PVC is not sustained because, okay, uh, RBOT may present as PVC or non-sustained BT, but it's much more common uh, PVC. So for me, if you see non-sustained or sustained BT, you should perform a MRI because the chances of having something else are higher. Beyond that, I think that if the PVC morphology is quite normal, and um, very important, the current complex or the ECG in sign of rhythm, because we often pay attention just to the PVC, but you, you should look at the rest of the ECG. So are there any T-wave inversion in precordial leads? Yeah. Because if there are T-wave inversions in, in B3, then the, the chances of uh, right ventricular dyspraxia are increased. And or if you have a low amplitude of current complex in the front and plane, the same. Uh, as a summary, I think if it's very clear, it's not need. But if you have any doubt, perform it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. That's such a very excellent answer. I think uh, there, there is another question from our uh, electrophysiologist from the our heart, National Heart Center. Do you have any cutoff for PVC burden? You know, asymptomatic RVOT PVCs, but low burden. Do you have any specific cutoff for you know how much burden that you consider that you will consider for an ablation? Uh huh. Okay, it's a, also a very good question. Uh, but I can reverse the question to you. What is the maximum burden that you should expect in a piece? that I've ever seen, Prof? Or, or the maximum that you can, uh, that a patient may develop. Okay. 40, 50, yep. 60, so, 70. What is the maximum burden that a patient may develop? The maximum burden is 50%. Because if you have more than that, means that you have more PVCs than normal sinus uh, rhythm complexes, so patient will be in BT. So the maximum burden is a uh, 50, okay? So just to put uh, things in perspective. Second, the, uh, there is not a clear uh, cutout because there are many different studies, each of them with different cutouts, cut cut cutoffs. So it's difficult to say this is the magic number, okay? Yeah. But as an average, as an average, there are two numbers that you may remember. 20% is the cutoff volume uh, as an average, that you should be a star worries, worry about the, the possibility of having a tachycardia with it, 20%. And the other magic number is 10%. Below 10%, the chances of uh, developing tachycardia myopathy are very low. So these two numbers should be kept in mind. Also, the other thing is that uh, PVC burden may change from time to time, okay? So you need to follow this patient. And this is why ablation is not considered a class 1 or class 2A yeah. in a patient with 25, because he may have 25 in January and in July is just uh, 5%. Huh? So, uh, but in general, these are the numbers. So if you see a patient with uh, less than 10% once, and uh, in a second halter six months later is 7%, you can probably safely discharge the patient to primary care uh, and, and stop following it. Stop following him because the chances of tachycardia empathy are very low. 
yeah. and the opposite for 30 percent thank you very much prof i think we have discussed uh, a bit more about the pvcs i would like to discuss more about the vt prof because uh, you mentioned about some indications of vt ablation are very more clear right now but the question is about the timing the timing of the documented vts right because you know in some center like uh, professor della bella from milan right because he treated vt very aggressively and even uh, like an, a primary pci right because he's doing it early do you have any comment about the timing for a vt ablation bro yeah it's also a very good question i think in the old times we if we had a patient with an icd I think the classical way of managing these patients is BT, stratal heart disease BT. You implant an ICD, and then patient has a recurrence, you start anti drugs, and then if the patient has a recurrence, uh, you ablate it. Okay? This is the current recommendation, in fact, in the guidelines. You have a patient with left ventricular dysfunction, because if the patient has no left ventricular dysfunction, mean that the prognosis and the BT is tolerated, that means that the prognosis is more or less okay, so you may choose between ICDs or ablation. But if the patient has left ventricular dysfunction or poorly tolerated BT, what is recommended presently in the guidelines is an ICD, recur recurrence, amiodarone, recurrence, then you may uh, use ablation. Okay, this is the current recommendation. However, at the time the, the, this recommendation was issued, the guidelines were published, Two papers appear. One was the Partita trial from De La Vela, and uh, the other was the Survive trial from our, our, our group. And what we reported is that in patients wearing an ICD or, and uh, they presented with BT, it was better to go directly to ablation rather than uh, in, uh, drugs. So, uh, what we should do, I think, okay, if it's a single uh, episode, uh, maybe if it's, uh, efficiently treated by ATP, okay, maybe you just need to follow the patient, that's it. But if uh, uh, it was associated with a shock, or it's not the first, it's the second, or was not well tolerated, then probably uh, our threshold of ablation should be lower and probably you should try ablation. Thank you very much, Prof. I think uh, we've we've running out of time a bit, but we still have some more questions. Do you still have time? Maybe five more minutes, Prof. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yes. You happy? Okay, sure. So there's another question from uh, Doctor e. Evan. Uh, how much is the risk of AV block if the patient already have left bundle branch block and also have uh, bundle branch reentry VT, and we try to blit the uh, VT itself? How to prevent the risk of AV block during the ablation? Yeah, this is a very good question and my favorite question. So for asking, thank you for asking it. Yeah, it's true. Because when you see a patient like, as the one that I present you with left bundle branch block, okay, and say, okay, uh, BBRT, so I go and um, ablate the right bundle, AV block. Perfect, no, uh, for sure. So for that reason, when uh, we saw that in the past, uh, we try to ablate the left bundle. We try to ablate the left bundle. Uh, the problem is that left bundle is not easy to be ablated because usually the right bundle is a uh, narrow uh, bundle that stretch from the hips to the apex. So you can uh, you can burn it in different places easily. The left bundle is a very wide structure that uh, very uh, as soon as it gets out of the his, it is spread out in, in many different fascicles. So first difficulty, it's difficult to ablate it. You need to go very proximal, so the chances of AP block are much higher. And third difficulty, you have a patient with left bundle branch block, and you want to block it, the left bundle, a little bit more. So it will be difficult to recognize if the ECG has changed. So eventually, it was a, a, a approach that we abandoned. So, to our surprise, when we ablated patients with left bundle branch block, the right bundle, none of them developed AB block. They changed to the other one. Why? 
because what we call Lev van der Brand's block is not necessarily a block. It only means that the left ventricle is being activated after the right ventricle. This is the only thing that means in this CG. Uh, and in fact, otherwise, if there was no residual conduction through this bundle, BBRT won't be possible. So in fact, in these patients, BBRT, uh, left van der Brand's block is not a true block. It's a slow conduction. So this explains why if you ablate the right bundle, uh, in general, what happens is that is uh, AV conduction remains, but with a swap pattern. The problem is that at the end, you don't skip uh, a pacemaker implantation because the, the result is that the HB, the final HB interval is quite long. And also it's not only long, is that you have a long HB plus abundant branch that is, you know, for sure that is completely wrong. So you need to implant a, a pacemaker. So at the end, you are not saving the pacemaker. Thank you very much, Prof. I think uh, this is the last question for our meeting today. Uh, as we know that coronary artery disease as the etiology of the sudden cardiac death is extremely high. Even in, you know, in Indonesia, the population is getting younger and younger, much way more than before. And now we have uh, in the era of extensive coronary revascularization, is there any change of pattern of the etiology of sudden cardiac death in, in your experience, Prof? You mean that uh, that uh, if there are, what, what we are seeing, but it's more in, in the studies, is that the sudden cardiac death is, uh, incidence is, uh, is decreasing in all populations, in, in non-ischemic and ischemic. And this is why uh, it's, it's curious, because maybe we are, we are here in this forum biased in favor of, of ICD. But uh, I think it was last year or maybe two years ago, I needed to give a talk in the Heart Failure Association Congress. And it was about, uh, I, I needed to give several. One, it was about uh, CRTD versus CRTP, uh, ICD as primary prevention. And it was amazing to see that they were really skeptical about the benefit of ICD. Why? Because the incidence is going down due to the use of these new four drugs. Uh, so they are skeptical. And this is why we are conducting in ERA this uh, trial, this profit ERA, yeah. the name, that is comparing in uh, ischemic patient, severe left ventricular dysfunction and heart failure, ICD versus conventional therapy. Because we want to reevaluate the indi indication and see if after 20 years of the MADI2 trial, if the benefits of uh, ICDs are still there. In terms of uh, prevalence, I don't know. I, I don't have a clear image. If they, they are getting old, uh, less, um, they are younger or not. Because in, in Spain, I think that more or less we follow a similar trend to the Western world. We were protected because our diet was. Uh, I don't know if it was similar to Indonesia because you are eating a lot of vegetables and so on. So we were really protected, but uh, then it changed to more hamburgers and so on. So our prevalence increased a little bit. But now I think that we are back again to, to less ischemic heart disease. So yeah, I think uh, the profit era, right, Prof? It, at, we will profit wait. Era. We will wait for the profit era and it might change the landscape of our uh, management yeah. strategies, you know, because the four pillars of heart failure is an amazing drug, right? So, yeah, 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 yeah it's true. Yeah, it's true. I think uh, we are very happy to have you uh, tonight, Prof. It's like having a, a Cristiano Ronaldo in our room tonight. So, no, no, Cristiano Ronaldo, no. <laughs> <laughs> or even Ra Rafael Nadal, whatever it is, right? So, thank thank you very much. We are you, we feel like we are having a superstar in our uh, meeting tonight. I think a uh, lot of people here in our audience would like to take a picture with you, if it's okay with you, Prof. No, of course, of course. No, I am. First of all, I am very honored. I was very honored to be invited. I'm very happy. 
to share with you and debate uh, with you this uh, topic that are passion for us. So very happy and thank you very much for, for this. And okay, happy to you. have such a positive meeting. We have learned a lot. I think the cardiologists, electrophysiologists learned a lot from our meeting uh, tonight. Please, I would like to invite all audience to turn on the camera so we can have a picture with the our guest for tonight. So, Prof, I, I hope that we can uh, collaborate further in the future, uh, whatever the forum is, education, yes, sure. or sure. whatever it is. For sure. Uh, uh, Professor Handajani or Dr. Handajani has my 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 details, so or we can exchange by email. Yeah, we'll more do. than happy. Honor, yeah. honor. Yeah. Yeah. Pro Professor Sunu, do you have any more uh, closing statement? Okay. I really appreciate uh, Prof. Merino. Thank you, uh, Professor Sunu. Thank you very much. I hope that the uh, organizing committee can uh, do the countdown. Who's going to do it? I think uh, Faisal or Ferhat will help us to count down for the pictures. Jim, kita right. mulai Thank ambil. you, Tangja. The screens are on my mark. In three, two, one, cheese. All right, finish, Tangja. I'll hand the meeting back to you. Thank, thank you very much. Once again, thank you very much, Prof. I, uh, we will keep in touch and looking forward for further collaboration. Thank you, Prof. And yeah, thank you, you to Dr. Ahmed as yeah. well. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, you, yeah. Good luck, Dr. Yani.